the Senior Health and Nutrition Seminar with Dr. Adam from Healthy Pets. He's the owner and chief clinician of my favorite integrative pet healthcare hospital in San Francisco. Um, we're really happy to have you here tonight. Our topic is dental health or troubled teeth. Um, any of us who have had a dog at, at any age know that um, dental health is an issue that gets overlooked and can cause serious problems down the line before you realize it. It starts as simple as you know a young dog with great teeth who could be chewing something to keep them clean and ends with you know, a senior dog who's suffering kidney failure due to untreated infections. Um, these are things that are preventable and I can't wait to learn more about it. Thank you. Thank you, Russell. Thank you, Adam. Thanks, Marie. Thank you, Manuel, uh, for hosting me. So yes, this is a, as we go through the topics uh, of how to take care of our older dogs, you know, we, um, yes, you know, it was just bound to happen, you know, we're going to, we're going to start talking about teeth and how that they impact health of, of your dog or, or your cat for that matter. So, um, so, you know, teeth, teeth are really nice organs, right? They're very hard. They're great for chewing things, for ripping things apart, for grinding things. Um, you know, they're very specialized organs. They, um, you know, you have, Dogs have fangs or canine teeth for for piercing through you know chest wall, abdominal cavity of their prey, and and um, you know and, and killing it and carrying it. Um, little incisors for picking and pulling, uh, premolars and molars for chewing, grinding, cutting. Uh, you know a tremendous shear shearing force uh, applied to the to to the surface of the enamel of the tooth. You know so so that so those those back teeth in a dog. Um, just like you know, the teeth of the lion, tiger, wolf, coyote are designed to cut through a very tough, tough, fibrous um, animal, raw animal tissue like like raw meat, and uh, and also you know they do a great job as far as the grinding of the bones. So you know, we'll do a bit of a demonstration in a bit when we come upon topic of, of whole food feeding. So you guys will see how uh, how well it can work for for some dogs. It's definitely not for everyone, uh, because not everyone has a very strong teeth. Or you know, it, it, it might so happen that by the time you you have met your dog, uh, he or she has had some dental problems and and suffered some damage to the teeth, perhaps um, you know lost some teeth, uh, or perhaps they're still kind of in a shape where you know the dog would be okay eating processed food, you know, dog food, canned food, soft homemade diets, but when it comes to, you know, whole foods like meat on the bone, they, they, they don't do so well on those foods anymore. So, um, uh, just gonna matter of, um, just so we kind of know the language, we're gonna talk about, uh, you know, three parts of the tube. We have a crown, which is the, the tough part that sticks above the gum line. It is made of enamel, which is the hardest substance in the body. Um, the tooth also has a root, which is uh, which is stuck in an alveolus or, or a socket. Um, and uh, uh, and root is made of basically bone. It's called dentin. Uh, so it's a certain type of bone. Um, unlike enamel, it is um, it is more porous. It is more bone-like. When you think of you know a bone, let's say you just eat a steak or chicken and you and you take out the bone, that is kind of what the the root looks like. Um, and the uh, and neck is the junction between the the crown and and the um, and the and the root of the tooth, you know. So uh, and normally the neck is covered ever so slightly by the gum line. So so you see a uh, so you see a, a tooth, you know, and then a gum line. And if if you were to pull the gum down, you would see the neck and then the root of the tooth. So um, so uh, what do we do? To keep our dog's teeth healthy. By the way, you know how how do you how do you know that your dog's teeth are okay? Like how many of you feel that they have dogs with healthy teeth? Like if uh, I know. If, I only know because you look at them. Like who would volunteer a dog for like you know the the dental toy ad you know like where they show you their teeth? You want to volunteer your dog and let's see what Adam <laughs> thinks of their dog. <laughs> Sure, you can take a look inside her mouth. Sure, let's, uh, let's bring her up on the table. And <laughs> That's a farm of Yeah. It is. It's and her new name is Liz Taylor. Liz Taylor. Oh, <laughs> 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 
in this this later. There's all the diamonds there. Oh, beautiful girl. Ah, uh, yes, let's see. And um, yeah, can you can you tell us uh, how old Liz Taylor is? Liz Taylor is probably eight or nine. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, what's her history? When did you get her? I got her in December. Okay. And um, she had been here fostered at Montville for six months before I got her. Okay. Uh, so how is she doing with her food? And what do you feed her? I feed her raw. I feed her a combination of primal and then some stuff from the honest kitchen that she doesn't really like so much. Okay. So right. I just mix in a little bit of it uh -huh. with the primal just to get rid of it and give her some variation diet. Okay. And do you see any signs of dental discomfort? Does she uh, tilt her head when she's eating? Any any twitching, shaking, uh, flinching? Any evidence of like a sharp pain when she's eating? Not that I know of, but you know, her food bowl faces the wall, so okay. maybe I'll turn it out so I can check. She does kind of like cock her head a little bit when she mm -hmm. eats. Okay. Uh, how about uh, uh, post eating? Does she do any wiping of the mouth? Does she plug her mouth, try, trying to kind of wipe the teeth or, or, or muzzle? No, I don't think so, but I do have a sheepskin rug that she sometimes like throws her whole face in, but I don't think she's like hardening her mouth. Okay, cool. And uh, what do you think about her breath? Um, it's all right. I brush her like probably th on average three times a week. So I try to get her every other day. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, she definitely has dog breath. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, but it's not like super bad. I don't think. Indeed. Uh, you know, <laughs> and, yeah, it's not bad actually. It's not bad at all. There's definitely a few things in in question, and she has lost a lot of teeth already. She yeah. probably is freshly, you know, put through the. Process. Well, you know, she. I guess she. She, she had eight extractions in right. the summer. Yeah. Right, right. You know, so and, and of course they kind of we pull out teeth that that look obviously infected or, or, or loose. You know, the ones that that seem like they could be salvaged. Um, you know, most vets will leave them in and and try to th try try things like periodontal treatment, which is uh, injecting a uh, an antibiotic laser gel around the base of the tooth you know, to try to stabilize the detachment yeah. in the gum. Or the socket and all well, the socket and the root of the tube. So, uh, so yeah, you know, so her teeth are actually doing okay. There is a couple of. She's got some black and some discoloration. She does, you know, gingivitis wise is very minimal uh, on the left upper side. Her first premolar is is um, is not really live anymore. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's slightly mobile. So, you know, does she carry it much? Well, um, we'll talk about this also. You know, how how do we know that dogs have any type of dent? dental discomfort? Well, the answer is we don't, because they really don't show any any signs of it, you know, unless they have uh, some type of really severe, severe digestive So, you know, uh, it, it's, um, do dogs don't really show that they have problems in their mouth till it gets very, very bad, you know, and oftentimes, you know, dogs will end up having Things like you know, proofing digestive upset or, or or urinary tract infections or or other things that are just kind of indications of of, uh, of increased overall stress on the body. So you know, where it's colitis, like you know, poop with the mucus and blood, or, or gastritis, which is you know, hacking, gagging, retching, reflux, or, or cystitis, or you know, it seems like the back is really hard to manage, or, or joints are really stiff, and you're doing all those glucosamines, omega threes, and and other things, and it's just not cutting it because you know you you, you still have some huge source of inflammation in the body that's not being addressed and that is kind of throwing your wrench in your management of other inflammatory diseases or, or, or problems in your in your in your family. But but all in all, you know, she gets like you know, um, seven and a half, let's say on the one to ten. So, oh, um, I think I have a zero or one here. Week, so. Gail, would you like <laughs> to? And she does have a cough. Would you like to ask her? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, so we'll talk so, about that. Yeah. Yeah, it's very interesting. You know, it's, uh, the, the dog cough is, you know, it's, uh, well, you know, if I, 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 listen, to, I listen to my patients, uh, my clients, and it seems like, you know, most dogs are coughing those days, you know, so, and I, uh, and it seems that, um, well, I, I think it's a lot of a lot of those problems actually are not coughing from lungs or bronchi. It's actually coughing from the stomach, which is that uh, we call it gastric cough or um, or you know we call it heartburn indigestion, um, gastritis, uh, acid reflux. Um, so Ari, she just problems. arrived in Montreal yesterday, so she hasn't yeah. had any uh, any exam yet. 
Yes. Yeah, you know, and, and she's a very good example of, of yeah, like, you know, one out of ten. Uh, because, you know, we have those, uh, you know, she, yeah, and, and th this probably will be handfuls as far as the, the dental, you know. So once you crack that huge tile of stone that's on the side of the tooth, you know, you'll see a whole bunch of exposed roots and, and the whole tooth will be very, very wiggly. Um, I suspect actually she will lose a lot of her teeth, you know. Look, look at the uh, the build up around the canine tooth, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty horrendous. Uh, and then the, the last uh, premolar for or carnasal tooth, there is some pus, some hair kind of shoved in a space where the neck of the tooth used to be. Well, now we have a, a gum line that's, that's pushed way up, you know, we have this huge amounts of stone and a whole bunch of crud in between just eating away at the, the, at the junction between the, between the crown and, and, the, and the root, you know. So let's see, how is your incisors? Um, yes, they're also pretty shut. Um, and you, can you guys smell our breath in there? Because it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, Sorry for yeah, doing yeah, but so, it's bad. You know, would, would she ever show any signs of discomfort? Well, you know, she's just, you know, she was just dumped by someone, you know, and, mm -hmm. and you know, she, she's, you know, she was thrown with a whole bunch of new dogs, new people, and, you know, she'll get that, you know, no one's out to get her here, but she is on her best behavior, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, so what what is she to do but, you know, look her best and trying to look the healthiest, the strongest, you know, just so no one uh, is trying to uh, take advantage of her or or um, it seems that in the dog, doggy world, not being well, being sick, you know, doesn't really get you any pity points. Uh, so dogs want to appear as strong, as confident as they can. Um, so, but yeah, you know, this little one, I would expect her to have, you know, definitely some digestive upset. It's not just, you know, let's say dogs have no pain, um, that, or what we think of as, as, as pain, you know. I mean, if, if, you, if any of you had teeth in this condition, you wouldn't be awake, you know, standing or wanting to be social in any type of, you know, way. So, and she, here she is, you know, not really panting, not really, you know, not stressed out, nothing is really, she seems like a fairly young dog, right? There's nothing wrong with her. So, um, well, and if she's a fairly young dog, hey, you know, maybe she's only six, seven, eight years old. Do, do we know her age at all? Yeah. No. Yeah. So, well, you know, but she could be actually a fairly young dog with, with really bad teeth. You know, so, which is which is actually quite common in toy breeds, big mm -hmm. chihuahuas, and toy bulldogs. So, um, so yes, yeah, so you know, she, yes, maybe she's she's very young, and and are you doing some homemade diets for her, or some fresh foods, or is she on process now? She's on the happy dog that they serve. She just arrived. She's she's staying here. Okay. She's our guest okay. for the workshop. Got it. Got it. <laughs> she's Excellent. on. All right. No, oh, what a sweet As close she is. to home cooked oh. as you can get. Yes. Uh, well, you know, so this is the, the example of, you know, hey, we got to this doggy when it's a little bit too late for the teeth, you know. So if we did dental implants for dogs, that would be a great. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but as it is, you know, the, the where we are as far as, you know, dental care in, in you know, in this country, and it is pretty good, you know, dogs that think get a better care here than elsewhere so mm -hmm. um, but even you know with, with dogs being taken care of very well almost really like children it's still gonna be a whole bunch, whole bunch mm -hmm. of extractions you know so all those bad teeth all the teeth that, that have significant root exposure will have to come out otherwise they they serve as a uh, as source of infection teeth like that are really too painful to use for any any type of chewing or grinding so uh, you know dogs do a lot of shuffling in their mouth to make sure they don't, they don't hit those injured or painful teeth. So, um, as a consequence, you know, of course, there's more and more stuff building up on those teeth because they're not being ground properly. So, so if you hey, if you clean her teeth and didn't pull them, you know, maybe she could be like on antibiotics for I don't know two months and maybe things would st stabilize somewhat. But the second she goes off of the antibiotic those exposed roots start collecting things uh, and, and that's when you start seeing festering of bacteria um, that's eating away at that biofilm or plaque or, or, or food residue that's, that's kicked up to 
to the porous dentin of the root. You know, it's one thing to wipe off your enamel because nice, smooth, and shiny dentin is not so shiny. It's, it's quite porous. It's, you know, it's very easy for things to, uh, to cake on, on top of it. So, hey, but otherwise, she's a great dog. You know, will she, will she be a, a happy dog when she loses her teeth and, and she's a dog with no teeth? No, she won't be. You know, she'll, she'll do just as well eating kibbles, uh, you know, canned foods, homemade diets, free ground raw foods, if that's what she does well on. You know, she will not be able to eat whole foods, like she won't be able to take down a, a chicken neck or, uh, or, or, or chicken wing or, or, or turkey wing, so, um, or maybe a whole sardine. Uh, and, you know, dogs that do lose all their teeth can gum you pretty badly too. It's not like they have no strength to mash things up, but, uh, you know, you cannot really grind the bone with, a, with, with soft tissue. It's, you know, it's just not a fair match. So, so yeah, she, uh, so, you know, this is, this is kind of a good time to intervene and take out those injured um, and, and diseased organs to pull back on the inflammatory load. So, so there'll be less, you know, less problems with her overall um, in the future. Um, again, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a really sad place to be. But it, you know, it, it's really, it would be sad, you know, if she stayed, if she kept her teeth the way they are right now versus if she lost them, you know, as far as the, um, the pressure uh, on her body, on her immune system, it is, it, is, it is very, very hard to keep up with it. You know, next, uh, as she gets older, she would have more and more problems with it. Mm -hmm. Well, she's, she has tons of problems with her teeth already, so um, I don't She's kind of beyond any of the pictures I <laughs> brought in. It's all. Uh, I mean, she, she really has, she really has that, that that hair caked around the base of the teeth is is your sign that things are really bad in there and and, and you need some intervention. Um, so I'm sure some of you or all of you had had dogs from Madville or elsewhere that you know, either. <laughs> you got with teeth like that or you know eventually they, they got pretty bad teeth because you know, no one's teeth get better over time, you know, than <laughs> our teeth. So it's it's not like you know, we're feeding them food that's too acidic or, or whatever, yeah, you know. And um, there there is a you know there's definitely a connection between what you feed your dog and, and how good the teeth look and, and we'll discuss this uh, coming up. So um, Yes. Can you tell us a little more about the sign and um, the wiping of the muzzle part? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how do we know the dogs have problems in their mouth? You know, because they, they can be extremely stoic about it, uh, as they are about you know back pain or, or digestive issues or, or cramping, you know, or, 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 or lameness. So, uh, well, so remember, you know, dogs that are injured that don't feel well will be kind of guarded. They, they don't feel well. They know there is a problem, they're, they're, they're weakened by the disease process and um, they just not their 100%, you know, and maybe you've, you've never had them when they were 100%. If you get a dog from Advil, well, they, they will come with their share of bad teeth, you know, so. Um, <laughs> not yours, but everybody. <laughs> right, right. Well, you know, I mean, JJ was, she had pretty nasty teeth, but mm. it took, you know, I know, a week of raw food feeding and, and she's, the teeth are fine, so. Um, but you know, I got her when she when she was very young, so and there was no damage to the teeth. You know, she's definitely grinding her her incisors. You can see uh, wear on it on the incisors. There's like a weird wear on her um, on her carnations because she's a very intense, very nervous dog. But um, you uh, that she grinds her teeth. Yeah, like she's people a. People do when they're stressed out. Yeah, she's a she's a she is definitely a wood personality, like a. Mm -hmm. A type type of dog. So, uh, well, so what other things do, do you uh, do you watch for? Well, reluctance to eat, you know. And there are perhaps there are some types of food that that feel especially bad when they hit exposed root. You know, if it's maybe it's a food that's too cold or too warm or or too acidic, you know. Or maybe there are snacks that you feed them that that will just cause a bad sensation in, in the root, and you might see an acute flinch or you know after a try or two, even if it's something very, very tasty, a dog will refuse to eat it. You know, in fact, they could be very picky eaters altogether, or they could go to a food dish, eat a little bit, and then be like, ugh, 
and walk away, they come back and eat a little bit more. So, so intermittent eating uh, or feeding uh, is another common way of dogs showing their dental dissatisfaction. Um, falling at the mouth, uh, and, you know, some dogs do it, some, some, some dogs don't, you know, the same with wiping of the muzzle on the, on the carpet or, or walls. Yeah, some dogs do it, I suppose. Um, you know, the, these guys do get root canals and abscesses on top of the roots, but most of those actually um, drain in, in, inside of the mouth. You know, you see draining tracts along the, the, the shaft of the root, you know, and, and a little red spot that, that, that's oozing things where you can uh, milk some pus or blood out of it. So, you know, would she, would she have really, like, wicked sore throat from that? Probably. You know, will she, you know, will she be a bit stressed out? Well, about many things in her life right now, but, you know, this is kind of, this is pr probably a combination of gastric cough, you know, uh, indigestion. Heart, heart stuff? It could be heart, you know, it could be, it could be, hey, she's, she's a small breed. She could have, you know, things like a COPD, you know, so, or, or chronic bronchitis. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, I wouldn't be surprised that she has some type of inflammatory disease um, because of the shape of her teeth. Um, there is a correlation between, you know, how your stomach feels and how your mouth feels. So if you mm -hmm. want to have a, uh, you know, think of people that are, you know, bulimic or people that are, that, um, uh, that, that I guess, you know, drink lots of acidic things like, like coffee, for example, you know. So, uh, you know, if, if you always have a... a a burning stomach, like like heartburn indigestion, you know, this actually that stomach inflammation will actually spill up and and lead to things like dry mouth, dry throat, and and you know, the, the drier the mouth is, the the more bad things will happen there, uh, and it'll be easier to for things to stick to the surface of the enamel. It'll be easier for food residues to get stuck in the corners, uh, and you know, if if you if one sleeps with a whole bunch of food in nooks and crannies of the mouth. Well, bacteria will act upon it, create acidic residues, you know, which will lead to a uh, decalcification of the tooth, you know, so, so the tooth becomes weaker after, you know, each night the dog falls asleep with a whole bunch of food around its, its teeth. So, um, uh, so what else do dogs do when they have discomfort? Um, that's that's pretty much it, you know. So, and if you guys have had any, um, you know, a unique presentation of dental pain, tell me, because, you know, I'm always looking for, like, other things to tell people, you know, how, how would the dog manifest that they don't have healthy teeth? Well, the other thing is, of course, like, you know, looking at, at the mouth, you know, and, and I cannot, I don't really know any person who would have any significant amount of brown stuff caked up on their teeth, um, you know, and I guess we're, you know, there's definitely a bit of like a social stigma about teeth. Like, you know, if you have good teeth, you're you're cool. If you have bad teeth, you're not cool. You know? so, <laughs> so maybe that kind of translates to dogs as well, which is you know, why so many dog owners will call down to those teeth. Like, you know, do we have to pull this tooth out? And like, yeah, we do. You know, so um, it's it's wicked. Really, so. So talking about bad things, so my foster has this amida bite, mm -hmm. and that probably caused by broken jaw. We don't know any history. Mm -hmm. So his teeth was okay, but you know, over time, you know, the underbite thing, you know, is there anything that we should be aware of? Or mm -hmm. It's not a cavity, but it's that. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a bit tilted to the yeah. side, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's probably a, a traumatic injury to the jaw, which with, which has shifted the, the axis, you know. So there is a, you know, so what that will uh, lead to is, you know, the teeth will not be. Uh, contacting each other the way they should, you know. So I mean, the the alignment of the teeth in the mouth is very specific. So you know, so so two opposing grinding surfaces can meet at some point to cut things or grind things. You know, if if you know if you happen to have a jaw that's that's tilted, or hey, if you're a dog that has an underbite or overbite, well, the upper incisors and canines probably will not meet very well. Or or maybe the you know I see dogs that that have underbite or overbite and the can one canine tooth will hit the other, and you see huge amounts of um, like wear on, on, on some of those teeth. You know, it's like a, it looks like someone took a file to look to those teeth and filed them. Well, no one took the file to those teeth; they were just filed by the upstairs tooth or downstairs tooth, whichever the case might have been. Um, you know, the incisors that, that aren't um, that cannot be used for picking and pulling. Well, you know, 
Well, these oh. these can be licked clean because they are in front of the tongue. Uh, as it, so, so these teeth oftentimes will be better than the teeth in the back. Uh, the, the teeth in the back are, are harder to get to as far as licking, uh, flushing them out. Um, and um, and yet there's some malocclusion, malalignment of the teeth. You know, when I think of dogs like, like, like um, um, pugs or uh, French bulldogs, you know, or, or um, who has, who has got a squished face? Uh, brachycephalic, yeah. you know. So, so you know, so their teeth. When I look in their mouth, the teeth are not straight. They're sometimes they're sideways. You know, they're 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 at the angle. So, and 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 as far as like meeting the partner from the upstairs, you know, it, it rarely happens. You know, so so there really isn't is no effective grinding or cutting surface uh, in those mouths. So, um, and then you know, and of course, the the health of the mouth also is impacted by what you put in the mouth. You know, so so as in you know the the food that your dog is eating. Um, but um. And does that answer your question about how to spot it? Or is there any, should I be, you know, should I be monitoring for something or just the way it is? And, you know, well, you should, you should be uh, monitoring for, um, you know, I, I call it avoidance behavior, you know, like looking for, like, what is this dog not doing? You know, so why is the food always in the left side of the mouth and never on the right side? You know, because it means something, you know, so usually, and I actually see it quite commonly. So, you know, dog will have one side that's worse than the other, you know. So, and the clean side is the side that they're using. The, the bad side is the one that they're not using, and more things will collect on top of the, you know, the old crud. And, and um, yeah, it, it, you know, it's kind of like a luck of a draw, which, which side of the mouth gets hit first by the periodontal disease. And, and, you know, let's say the right side of the mouth gets the first painful tooth. Well, the workload gets shifted to the left. And, and these teeth do get a workout, the, the bad side doesn't, you know, so, you know, so things start going opposite direction as far as the, the maintenance or, or, or cleansing of the teeth just by chewing on a food. Um, what shall we talk about? Uh, well, you know, let's, let's talk about what, what type of dental problems, you know, you guys will see in your, in your dog. So, um, Tartar or, or, or calculus, you know, so it's, it's this brown hard deposit. Um, you know, oftentimes when I have clients come in with their with their patients and there's brown stone on a teeth, I I do this demo where I go in and like pop this thing off and 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 you you get this tile that has this beautiful imprint of the tooth on the inside and and a smooth you know brown counter on the outside and it smells horrible, you know, and they're like, oh my god, you just broke my dog's tooth. I'm like, no, this tooth is there. Here's, this, here's some stone that was on top of the tooth. So dental tartar, you know, it's a, it's a result of uh, many, many weeks, two months of, uh, of accumulation of biofilm, which we call plaque. So the, the starchy residue mixed with mucin and, and saliva, um, you know, it creates a, a, a microscopic net of food and and sticky substances, and it sticks to the teeth. Um, and um, you probably have some on your teeth right now. If you go to the back of your tooth and scrape some, you'll get this uh, white, nasty stuff from it if you haven't brushed your teeth in the past 12 hours. So, um, and you had any type of starchy food. So, anyways, you know, uh, day after day, you know, you have this microscopic layer of stone caked up on top of the, uh, the, the preceding layer. And, um, you know, dogs go to sleep with the teeth that they haven't brushed, and, and yet there's lots of plaque in the mouth, and, and, and you know, not, 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 not that I promote dental brushing to everyone or, or many patients or clients, you know, it seems that the, the tooth brushing compliance rate is very close to zero within a week or two because of the, uh, and it's, I think it's a, uh, it's, it's a, um, it's a unanimous decision between the owner and, and the owner <laughs> uh, really working out so well. So. I have a question. One of my dogs will allow you to brush her teeth all day long, and the other one will leave nickname Baby Trash Mouth, and she will not. Like, you can't even dental wipe her. She will mm -hmm. take your hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you do with those ones that are just like, this isn't happening, no matter how mm -hmm. much you try? 
well, you know, so from up is pretty rotten, as in painful. You won't be able to do, you know, to hit her, hit her roots with either bristle or even a, a, you know, a sponge or, 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 or cheese cloth. You know, if you, if you press on the tooth, it's loose or infected, it hurts. So, so this, is, this is a type of, um, you know, so, so you see a reaction. And, you know, this could, have, this could be behavioral as well. Like, she just doesn't want her mouth messed with. Maybe there's only just one bad tooth, and that's enough for her to be like, ah. No Every way. time we do the dental, or take her, and they look at her teeth, they're like, she's fine. Mm -hmm. She just won't let us near her mouth. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, again, that, that's perhaps just a personality type, you know, and, and, and she doesn't like to be restrained that way. You know, it's, it's, it's not a natural thing for a dog to have someone shove things in their mouth like that. So, <laughs> well, yeah. uh, you know, and you can How train them. around that? <laughs> Well, the same way as you as you get around, you know, dogs not liking their their nails trimmed. Like, how is she doing with that? Can you trim her nails? I have to take her to do that. Oh, well, there you go. So, <laughs> <laughs> so plays on to clean her teeth as well. So, um, but but yeah, you know, there, there are dogs that, that are whether they are just of a personality that that that's somewhat on a shy and they you know they, they they find it intrusive. You know, they don't want people messing with them. And, and putting them in a, in a very vulnerable situation or position. So, um, so it sounds like the teeth are not aren't really that bad. She just doesn't like the whole thing of, of, of being approached and, and, and restrained and, and someone messing with her mouth. Again, not unlike if someone is trying to, you know, trim her nails or clean her ears, perhaps. Uh, so, and the other dog is like, eh, why not? Attention, attention is good. So, um, and as long as there's no bad teeth, you know. The dog will be into it, um, and uh, you, you know most of my patients. I've, I've, if they don't have really bad teeth, they'll have some gingivitis. They actually do like to have the, the mouth massage because there is like the dull throbbing sensation there, and, and they want to be. They actually enjoy being scratched uh, or, or massaged around their mouth. You know, if not directly with your finger that's covered with you know piece of cloth. Um, actually, we can do it over the skin, and, and it still it still helps. You know, you can still massage the salivary gland. You can still massage the um, the lower jaw, the upper jaw, and get some flushing going. You know, actually actually get the dogs to flush out that corner of the mouth where things tend to collect. Um, so I remember, like, it's really hard to put a tip of a tongue behind your last molar. Um, and you know, these guys, I'm sure, are are trying their hardest, but it's 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 not easy. <laughs> And, and you know, dogs actually, when you compare a dog to a human, you know, dogs have much longer muscles, and they're and they're like our teeth are very like round, like half a circle. You know, like theirs are more pointy, so it's it's harder to reach the back of, it's harder to reach uh, the back teeth with, with that tip of the tongue. Um, so does it answer your question? Uh, it doesn't sound like she 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 has any dental issues per se, uh, but. Uh, she has a bit of a personality thing that, that again can be trained out perhaps, or you know, a lot of doggies like her. You know, small dogs can be very insecure. Um, you know, you try to do a desensitization, so so some type of a a positive re, uh, positive association with the activity that, she, that she's trying to conduct, um, whether it's you know snacking her or or petting her or I don't know. Playing music or my therapy, whatever, whatever it takes. Um, but in general, dogs don't don't really enjoy being restrained and, and having their teeth messed with like that. So, um, well, and it's important to to do this. You know, it's important it's important to wipe those teeth because you know that that stone will will happen. You know, layer after layer. You know, you end up with a really thick chunk of stone that that is pushing on the gum. Uh, it, there is a space that, that is created between the top uh, the top of that, that stone and uh, and the, uh, the and the and the gum line. So uh, and that's when things tend to accumulate as well, and that's where bacteria are having a party and, and kind of eating away at the gum, pushing it away from the crown, working their way towards the neck of the tooth, as in you know, the dentin, you know, and then further down to expose the roots and. And that's when you say, "Hey, my dog has periodontal disease." You know, so the, there's inflammation or infection uh, in the ligament that connects the root to its socket. You know, and that's again that that is that that is a very slippery slope towards a tooth loss. Yes. Um, she's a 
she's about five and she's rescued when she's three. Um, I don't think she doesn't have you know, periodontal disease, but she definitely has plaque. One mm -hmm. of the things to do to prevent it from getting that, like she'll tolerate the teeth brushing, but I also told her that she needs a professional cleaning mm -hmm. that's going to cost like you know, eight hundred dollars. Is that something that suggests us doing it and spending the money, or trying to see brushing her teeth and? Well, yeah, you know, an eight hundred dollar dental cleaning twice a year is probably not in everyone's budget, right? So, so you would have some type of five years. Right, right, right. You know, so, um, so yes, there are there. I guess let's go right to it. You know, how how do you prevent this from happening? So, so yes, you know, you want to physically remove that biofilm before it before it becomes tartar. Once it's one once it is you know deep yellow to brown and hard, as in it actually feels like a uh, like a like a deposit on the, on the bottom of your uh, of your kettle, which is like the calcium deposits, you know. So uh, once it gets to that point, uh, well, yes, you can use things that can decalcify that that plaque, you know, as in you know you can use a uh, what, what's the liquid plaques? There's all kinds of enzymatic things you can use, including toothpaste that you can use to try to uh, you know, cut some cracks in, in that in the matrix matrix of that stone, but but it is it's pretty, it's pretty tough. You know, usually um, it is not too bad if the gums aren't too painful. I will just get my fingernail between the gum and the stone and pop it off, and it, it comes right off. Um, it's actually quite. It's actually one of the one of the very rewarding feelings you get. Like yeah, once you like remove that, that huge chunk of stone, and there's this beautiful white tooth underneath. So uh, and the gum is like you know the gum is like crying little tears of blood, but then, but it's, but it's, but it's happy, you know? so it's kind of flash, it's like, oh, I can finally flush that stuff out of there, you know, so it's like a, like a dam of stones, you know, keeping the pus and bacteria, you know, the nasty stuff underneath the gum line, um, and again, that's what fuels that, that progression of periodontal disease. All right, so, so brushing, you know, brushing can be pretty painful, especially if the gums are raw already, because, you know, bristles will slide and they'll hit Part of the tooth that might be already too damaged to uh, to deal with that. So, so I usually recommend just using your finger. You have way more directional control over where the tip of the finger goes, you know. So, uh, and you also have a fingernail, which is, you know, pretty, you know, it, it's it's very nice, sharp. Uh, you can use uh, a paper towel, a cheesecloth, you know, gauze bandage, uh, uh, you know, thin fabric, um, and just go at it. You know, just go and wipe the teeth and, and see how much stuff you're getting from it. And and even if there is a, you know, even if there is, you look at your dog's mouth and there's just stone everywhere. Well, you know, start, you know, just see what happens. You know, it's not like it's impossible. And if you're using things like enzymatic uh, toothpaste or, you know, there are some other enzymatic gels and liquids that you can use to massage the gums and, and work at the tartar. Yeah, eventually, you know, you will start to see it, uh, you know, chipping or crumbling, and 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 you know, one one little tile will pop off, you know, and this kind of gives you a and in to to get them, you know, if, you, if there's like one piece of stone missing, well, it creates a, a kind of sharp edge so you can get there and, and pop the rest of it off. And that's, I know it's easier said than done. And, and, uh, but, but yeah, it's a uh, think of, I guess, you know, it's kind of like your own teeth, you know, just try to keep them as clean as possible. Um, I have a question. Yes. You keep on saying en enzymatic toothpaste, mm -hmm. so they'll say that on it that it's an en enzymatic toothpaste. Well, well all dog toothpaste you... are enzymatic because okay. you know the, the dog toothpaste is edible, <laughs> unlike our toothpaste, you know, which contains you know fairly um, high amounts of fluoride uh, and not as toxic or anything, but I guess you're not supposed to be eating it and. I, I haven't heard of uh, fluoride toxicity. Like I've never heard of a dog eating toothpaste and dying from it or anything. But um, yeah, I had a dog that ate a whole chick once. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she was fine afterwards. I don't know about. I know <laughs> this was before the days of like yeah. obsession with dog teeth. So I don't yes. know how her dental health was mm. the rest yeah. of her life. Well, I'm sure. But so good. yeah, so fluoride ingesting fluoride isn't so great for them, and all the dog toothpaste will be enzymatic. That's right. So instead of fluoride, uh, you know, there'll be something of enzyme. It's usually a plant-derived enzyme from papaya or pineapple that that you know that's designed to cleave bonds between you know carbohydrate molecules, um, you know, which which are part of 
of that lattice or 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 net of plaque of plaque and mucus and, and all kinds of other crap that, that sticks to the teeth. So um, you might have heard of things like um, like plaque off or, or, or healthy mouth, you know, so like other things that you can use in food and water that will um, that will like some of these things, you know, plaque off for example, it's a it's like a powdered um, ionized it's a seaweed, you know, with ionized uh, with ionized um, um, iodine in it. So um, and the idea is that you know eating this type of food helps to create a uh, a negative charge on the surface of the enamel, and it actually repels a uh, a plaque particle from from sticking to it. You know, so like a magnetic protection, so to speak, um, against um, against adhesion of biofilm to the surface of the enamel. Um, the healthy mouth, there's both gel and stuff that you put in the water. So um, and you know, there's chlorophyll and there's other enzymes that that you know that will, that will help to to chisel away at, at that at the, at the matrix of that stone that's that's caked over over around the tooth. Um, you know, but but how can you get dogs to actually do their their own darn brushing? You know, I mean, they they have well, they don't have hands or anything, but uh, but they have. You know, how do we the, how do we engage those teeth so they actually just kind of back to the point in the first place, you know, uh, teeth must be used for their intended purpose in order to remain healthy. If you don't use them, you lose them, you know, so, yes. Yeah, and I mean, my question is, that is just dog teeth probably is the fact that these are domestic animal versus, you know, what do that wild animals do, you know, what do that lions, you know, do they have really horrible dental issues, you know, and... Um, well, I mean, animals in the wild, there's other stressors in their mouths, and like hey, they they fight with each other and they break off their canines. You know, and, I mean, li lions and tigers get root, root infections, you know, and, and their canine teeth and and you know, huge abscesses. And and, um, and if they live in zoos, well, whether they live in zoos or outside, if they actually you know do what they're supposed to be doing, as in they kind of stick to their script, you know, as as they read in, in like the natural history book, you know, yes, they are killing, they're, they're bringing down the whole prey, you know, in, in a pack and they and they tear it apart with their teeth. They have no hands, they have no knives, they use their teeth as, as cutting tools and that is what keeps those teeth clean. And, you know, and I'm really not making this up, you know, I, I've had many, many dogs that came in with substantial dental tartar and, and fairly bad gingivitis and they and their owners institute a, a whole food feeding and once or twice a week and that is, and oftentimes it is enough to actually get rid of that, that stuff from the teeth you know so as in chip of the, uh, the the stone you know you might end up with some degree of gingival recession after everything is said and done but it, it actually does work um, hey if, if your dog is not taking to it that means that it, it, it hurts it hurts when they try to do it you know most dogs you know, want to chew. They kind of like to chew. You know, they're kind of designed to to chew our garbage and and chew on the bones. But um, if they are abandoning the, if, if they are choosing to abandon the behavior, it is usually because it doesn't feel very good to them. So, um, what else can we do for bad teeth? So, so how do you engage? How how do you engage them? So, what kind of foods can you feed your dogs that will help to cleanse them out? So. Hey, how about some uh, doggy chewing gum, like, you know, uh, chewing after eating, right? So, uh, well, we shouldn't give our dogs chewing gums, but, <laughs> however, you know, you can give them things like um, carrot sticks, celery sticks, uh, pieces of, 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 uh, of red or bell peppers. Um, they can have wedges of apples. They can have uh, any other fruit that's fairly crispy and crunchy. So, you know, think of what makes your mouth water, you know, what makes your mouth feel like you've just flushed it, um, and it is eating, you know, low starch, high moisture foods, um, so, you know, other things that you can use, you can definitely use things like, like meat jerky, like, like beef strips, chicken strips, uh, duck strips, um, you know, they are dry, they're single protein, I'm sorry, they're single ingredient snacks, you know, and they're, they're not starchy. They're they're proteinaceous. You know, it's just a piece of dry meat. So so there is you know, it, it's different than you know chewing a raw meat, but it still provides a lot of dental exercise. Um, and 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 there is some use out of 
and, and then the teeth do get used, you know, while the dogs are are, are chopping those things down. If you notice your dog um, cutting things down incompletely or, or being very reluctant to do it and then eating very big chunks, uh, as, a, as though it seems like it should be a little bit more chewed up before it's, it is swallowed, you know, that is also an indication of dental discomfort. If they eat, you know, huge pieces of of, of, uh, of, of duck strips or rawhide, um, and they bring it up, you know, because it is just too big. Um, that mean that that means usually that they they said, well, you know, I'm done with chewing. We're just gonna done over with, and, and they swallow. But sometimes it's just too big. You know, it's it's too pokey to the stomach wall, and it initiates a vomiting reflex. Uh, so organ meats, you know, uh, who has ever given their dogs things like tripe or gizzards? Yeah, muscles like gizzards. Yeah, yeah, it's good stuff. So by, uh, they run between like nine nine cents and two dollars for a pound of um, of chicken gizzards. It's usually half and half mixed with a uh, chicken heart, um, and then um, they look kind of benign, right? You know, they're it's like a very tough muscular stomach of the of the bird that's been cut in half and rinsed off, and uh, and it's a very it's a it's a very tough sucker, you know. It's very very gummy, so it, it takes a while for a, a a small dog to chew it up, you know, if they if they choose to do so. Um, so so they so there's no bone really, you know. If you, if people are afraid of using giving their their dogs bones because you know bones get stuck in dogs or or something, well, hey, try some tough fibrous organ meat that still requires some cutting before it is swallowed. So so tripe, which is a, a, a cow stomach, you know, it's usually you, it comes in huge sheets that are usually uh, cut into strips uh, and gizzards of chickens, um, turkeys and ducks make a very good dental snack. And hearts, you know, beef hearts, um, beef hearts are pretty bulky too. Yes. Oh, uh, how do you prepare that? Can you just feed it to them raw? Or do you need to cook it? You can feed it to them raw if they're used to raw foods. Uh, mm -hmm. Otherwise, I recommend um, rinsing them off very well. You know, the uh, you haven't gotten those these organs that come from animals that that were septic, hopefully, right? You know, where the bacteria would be all over the tissues. You know, mm -hmm. so so you have a, a problem with contamination of the surface only. You know, so if you rinse it off. I usually, and that's true about you know, any type of whole food or raw food I, I do, you know, I, I just put in a bowl of hot water uh, to make it feel like it's been freshly killed, you know, then after a while dump it off, you know, pour another, do another bath or, or rinse, and then it's, you know, then it's clean on the surface. Um, so, um, however, you know, some dogs, like, you know, it seems like the stinkier the better, right? Like, you know, in fact, you know, some of your dogs might take that, the, the drumstick or, or chicken that can go to the garden and, and bury it or, or, or bury it inside of your house somewhere um, because they want to ripen it, you know. So, um, so, so you know, when it comes to raw foods and whole foods like, like meat on a bone, which is, you know, necks, wings, uh, drumsticks, uh, you know, chicken feet, um, you know, whole fish, you know, all of these things are great, but, but you know, you have to be clean. You, you have to, you know, there, there has to be a degree of... Um, Sanitary techniques used when preparing this food because um, I mean there's definitely bacteria on, on that food you know, and, and and if you bought meat that was factory um, farmed or, or raised you know you might end up with some nasty species of E. coli and salmonella that that can become pathogenic you know hence hey, hence this big label on every piece of meat that you buy in store saying cook it thoroughly uh, because you know we we make no Promises that eating it raw will not kill you. So, right, you know the the as far as the quality control or quality standards, you know the, the raw foods for dogs have about one tenth of the bacterial counts as compared to the meats that, we, that people buy for for our consumption. You know because again, our our the meat that we buy for ourselves is not intended to be eaten raw. Um, the you know, primal Jeffries, uh, small batch. You know, they 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 actually make sure that the bacterial counts are very very low because you know these are ready to use foods. As in, you thaw them out and you give and you slap it in a, in a dog's bowl and they eat it. So, has anyone tried the uh, necks or backs or wings drumsticks? Did you try a uh, necks? Yes. Necks, yeah. Necks is an excellent. Excellent. 
Mm-hmm. And I really like next, you know, the, uh, the, so you know, let's talk about the, uh, the myth of the, uh, the, the chicken bone that she gets attacked. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Are you talking about the chicken neck or just the dog? Well, it depends on the size of the dog. You know, it seems that the dog's her size, um, you know, the, the chicken neck isn't very challenging. So, you know, they'll apply a few crushing moves to it and they swallow it. So, so there isn't that much of the effective chewing and gnawing at it, you know, as if she got a big sh- slab of meat, as in a turkey neck, you know, and that is, that is like a good dinner portion for her. I mean, you know, she, if she gets less than five drumsticks, she's gonna not have it, you know, so, or, or, or less than like a, yeah, turkey neck, which is, uh, I, they come in different sizes, they're, they're between, you know, three quarters of a pound and, and a pound, let's say. So, um, which is, which seems to be a, a decent dinner for a dog that's about 40 pounds. Did you sit? Sit. Good girl. Lady. So she's gonna take it in the corner and and uh, and take it apart to do nothing. Um, so Adam, are you saying that if you regularly give them food that is crunchy, that that can substitute that reactional need of of brushing your teeth? You know what I'm saying is that brushing is, is very unsustainable. So uh, whether you have a dog with, with fairly decent teeth or a dog that that has some dental discomfort, um, well, okay, who's gonna budget you know five minutes a day um, to try to brush your dog's teeth? You know, it's, it's not really it's not really a very good bonding experience for for people and their pets because. Again, it, it's somewhat intrusive to a dog to do that, you know. So, again, some dogs, you know, like love to be in their own owner space, and 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 you know, if if you mess with their mouth, they they love it and they get into it and they think it's a it's 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 a game and it's great. Hey, if you can use some type of a push and pull toy or you know, Kong toy or any type of you know other toy that you can. Um, that the dog wants to chew on and, and grind and, and, and use to massage the teeth, well, go for it. You know, I, I actually feel it's, it's more effective, it's actually more effective than trying to get a finger or toothbrush in there. You know, giving a dog a, let's say, a, a, one of those Kong, Kong toys, the, the, the hollow rubber toy filled with, you know, a few sears of peanut butter or, or, or filled with frozen broth, you know, where they actually kind of like get this icicle and they chew on it, on it, you know, that it is safe because it's rubber, so it's really hard to break a tooth on it. Um, but, you know, think of all the defective gnawing and chewing and, and grinding they're trying to do, and all, all of this actually helps to uh, remove that biofilm. So, so yes, I only put two That was yummy, huh? That was good stuff. Good to figure out. Oh, okay. really. there's tons of salmonella on it. Uh, well, I, 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 <laughs> even no, though I meant for the dog. <laughs> Uh, you know, I also have chickens, you know, and my dog is a lot of chickens. Live so chickens. I, I, <laughs> what else? He means oh, like chickens as pets. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, so and they, they eat so much chicken poop. I I really don't worry about some uh, on the meat. Um, again, you know, um, you know, it's kind of survival of the fittest, right? In a in a world of, of 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 meat production. So you know, so most animals that are raised for slaughter will be raised on on feeds that contain some type of bacteriostatic or, or bactericidal agents, you know, so they can be crammed, you know, 50,000 head in a, in a long uh, barrack or, or, or what do you call them? Factory farms, is that what you're Yeah, yeah you know, so, and, and they don't die of, they don't all die of, you know, some horrible septic disease or, or dysentery. So, so, you know, so, so these persons, you know, actually um, favor, um, survival of very tough species of salmonella in, in E. coli. So again, this is exactly why, um, you know, why there are labels on, on meat that you buy in the supermarket to cook it thoroughly because there there is no guarantee made that it's a meat that doesn't contain pathogenic species of bacteria. Uh, 
you know, E. coli and some other are, are part of the normal gut flora of, of us, but there is, you know, so many different types of them, so many different um, serovars or, or um, uh, uh, let's call them like families of bacteria. You know, there, there, are, there is good salmonella and there is not so good salmonella. There are E. coli that are, that are happy and they actually we need them in our gut to stay healthy and there are some that produce toxins that, that make our gut react very badly. Yeah, I only ask because I'm a dietitian, and if I didn't tell every person I came into contact to cook it like so thoroughly, mm -hmm. you know, I would be sued into next year. So I want to make sure before I give it to my dog mm -hmm. that well, dogs should never eat cooked. Right. So yeah. well, mm -hmm. we'll get to no, no good. But as far as the preparation, so yes, you know, so as a person dealing with raw meat, you have to be careful, okay. you know, because. If you lick your fingers after you give her a, a, a raw chicken neck, well, you could actually get exposed to it. And 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 your know, dogs are 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 scavengers. You know, they are omnivores. They have they usually have very very tough guts, as in they can eat nasty things and be and be fairly fine, uh, or, or get over get over it pretty quickly. So so, but we're a little bit more fragile than that. So hey, you know these guys do eat poop. Right, and plenty of it, and and it is that there is a lot of bacteria in a poop, and again, bird Garbage. poop. Whether it's you know bird poop, usually you know it's it is it is just kinds of gram positives, which is Salmonella, Clostridia, and E. coli. Oh, sorry, E. coli is gram negative. So um, but yeah, it's it's not, you know, like I mean, there's E. coli everywhere. You know, it's it's really the amounts of it and 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 subtypes of it. You know, so again, some are uh, some are okay to to be exposed to and some are not you know no one's mouth is sterile no, no one's hands are sterile we are covered with bacteria there's more bacteria there's no there's more microbes living on you and in you that there are cells of your own body so you know we are at number right there so and there is no way to get rid of them not that, that you would want to you know hey take antibiotics for two weeks and see what type of dysbiosis you will create like you know if you don't get if you don't have a, a good cooperation with your intestinal bacteria, you know, you tend to get very sick, you know, so, and then you have unrelated inflammatory processes in the gut, and you have, you know, a, a wiping good bugs creates a space for bad bugs to, to get in there and, and get a little party, so, so, yes, in, in your case, you know, if you were to recommend uh, to your clients to feed their dogs raw, you'd have to tell them to be very careful about how they handle it. You know, and that's true about you know people that feed Primal or, or Jeffries. You know, there, there's the same disclaimer. You know, it's, it's raw food. You know, be careful around it because you know it can be contaminated. Uh, so, um, does it answer your question? The short answer is the dog can handle it. Yeah. The dog can handle it. The dogs can handle a lot. You know. That's pretty clean for what dogs would rather eat: the dry food and <laughs> garbage. Right. You know, and and, and gut is uh, you know just just like a. I guess just like you know, any muscle in the body or, or, or too far about it, you know, it, the more you use it, the stronger it gets. So dogs that get challenged with all kinds of different foods, you know, variety of, of in their diet. Well, these guys are very, um, you know, you you can give them n new things, things that have they haven't had before, and and they aren't at as high of a risk of having bad reaction to it because. You know they are adaptable. You know the, the gut is, the, you know the gut just knows, hey, like you know it's gonna be the same thing all the time coming in. So I have to, I have to get stronger. You know when I, when I first meet a, a you know client and a pet, and I tell, I tell them, hey, like you know before you, before you get to the raw food, make sure, make sure you give your dog some fruits and vegetables and some yogurt. You know like make sure that the gut actually gets stronger. You know you want some muscular strength for the gut so it can grind and, and mix things well. Uh, you know, most dogs, guess what they do? You know, they put, they push this oatmeal consistency stuff down the tube, and you know, it, it, it does get weak. So then you try to challenge them with something that's not dog food, and they they get bad reaction to it. So, so you know, so no, don't throw them in the deep water. Um, you have, it's and again, not that some dogs cannot go from dry food to to, to a turkey neck, um, but it is a, it's, it's better to take you know a few days to a few weeks. Uh, to make a, a full transition. Um, so, uh, but yes, yes, you know, dogs can can eat this stuff, and they are very happy about it. Yes. So my foster just love veggie and fruit. Mm -hmm. So should I just stay with that, or giving you know the neck, or you know 
these are have a different benefit mm. or combination. Well, well, you know, it's, it's different. It's very different. You know, fruits and vegetables deliver different things than a uh, than a turkey neck. You know, fruits and vegetables deliver you know moisture. They deliver you know lots of phytonutrients, so vitamins contained in, in those fruits and vegetables. Uh, you know, water soluble antioxidant vitamins like vitamin C, vitamin E, um, and uh, beta carotene. Um, they provide lots of moisture. They produce they provide fiber, which is a you know, which is something that mm. we actually have to eat to feed our good gut bacteria. You know, so so pre prebiotics are 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 types of fibers that serve as a food source for the beneficial bacteria in our guts. And uh, so if you take if you eat those prebiotics, you know, you you are making it very um, easy for those good um, gut bacteria to stay in there and, and thrive. You know, again, the, the better relationship you have with those guys, the more you benefit from it. Um, Since he loves vegetables, virtually just stick with it. Yeah. Right, you know, the, the caloric gain from it is is, is really it is minuscule. You know, it's, it's it's not really something that you would worry about. You know, I mean, how many carrots can you give to a dog before they get before before they start getting fat? Well, <laughs> a bag. You know, <laughs> and then, then it's gonna be really hard to make a dog fat to be feeding them. You know, carrots, apples, pears, melon, you know, things like that. It's, it's just, they actually are insignificant sources of calories. Um, so it's, it's different stuff you use them for, you know, since so fiber, moisture, phytonutrients. Um, you know, the, the chicken eggs you use them for protein, uh, calcium, and fatty acid, very important, you know. So, so you know, we all think of, of meat. Like when you think of good meat, you know, you, you always think of, you know, a chicken breast is like the best type of meat. But it isn't, you know, it's actually not so good. You know, it's like a pale, tasteless piece of meat. The good stuff lives in liver and lives in the bone marrow, in the red marrow of the of the bones. So so the, the skull bones, neck bones, rib bones, and to some extent long bones, but but usually long bones are, are filled with more fatty type of marrow. So they're not as nutritious as bone of the of the um, we call it axial skeleton, so like the axis which is your your spine. To the pelvis and and ribs. Um, yes. Thoughts on marrow bones. Mm -hmm. Good. They're good. You know, bones? yeah. The beef bones are different than poultry bones. You know, so you get those and, and you see they're kind of bulky. They are big. You know, they, they are not from birds that that are light light boned. You know, they are from heavy boned land dwelling animals that put you know a ton of of weight sometimes literally on those bones. So. And they come as a like a whole knuckle, like the tip of the bone. Sometimes you know it comes in cut in half, so you get a like you know one one candy or one of those like round parts of the tip of the the long bone. And and the marrow in that is a fatty marrow. You know it's a, it's this white marrow in there, so, which is kind of greasy. And, and dogs love licking it out. You know, so it, it does provide a good amount of fatty acids, uh, but it is not the red marrow that you know. I know if you guys. So, like, um, it is in the in the chicken bones, the red marrow is only at the tips of the, the long bones. In the middle is actually hollow bone. So, um, but when she cracked the bone, usually like the piece of that the red gel just shoots out, you know. So, and that's that's the good stuff. That, that these are the nurseries of of the uh, of blood cells, you know. So, so that's where the body holds everything to create, you know, a new, you know, every nine or ten days we have. We have a whole bunch of new white blood cells. Every 120 days, we have brand new red blood cells. You know, so all these cells are being continuously produced and and replaced, um, and they are produced in bone marrow, and and that's where the body, you know, will store B vitamins and and you know protein and fats, you know, all the things that are required for for generating huge amounts of cells that that end up in circulation. So. Um, I have a question. Yes. If you're using crunchy foods specifically to brush your teeth, mm -hmm. how often are you doing it? Um, I mean, like we brush our teeth every day, or we brush our teeth twice a day. Are they kind of the same type of schedule? You like does JJ eat crunchy foods to brush your teeth? How many times a day? Or it, it is not every night. You know, I I I'm not usually home by dinner time, so unfortunately. But you know, so so she will get the homemade diet, which is which is, uh, you know, it's a, 
what is my latest invention of, in the homemade <laughs> diet front? Yes, I have a I have a really nice recipe that she loves, and it is a pound of ground turkey, a pound of gizzards, and a pound of liver, um, oh, wow. and that is mixed with uh, what three grams? Not in one meal. <laughs> on one batch. In one batch. Yeah, yes. you know, and, and mix a yes, mix like a. Yes, we one batch. Yes. Yeah, you know, I, so so three pounds of that, and you know, whatever calcium need, uh, you know, is needed, which is you know, three grams mm -hmm. for a pound of, of, of meat. Um, you know, I put liver in, so I, I got I got all my fatty acids taken care of. Um, all the essential oils are there, and then I I mash it pound for pound with a uh, with vegetable. And it's usually, you know, it's usually peas and carrots or, or broccoli, which is, you know, kind of the cheapest stuff you can get. And as far as fruits and vegetables, when uh, when farmers markets are are more more lively, you can usually get veggies for a buck a pound and, and chop them mm -hmm. and steam them and use that as the uh, as the substrate to match to match meat pound for pound. Um, you know, when you if you have a dog that doesn't who finds it too rich, well, you can alter the ratios. You know, you can actually push it more towards like you know, sixty percent veggies, forty percent. You know, meat and meat and fat. Uh, if if that is if, if if that is too much, you know, if you have a very small dog with with kind of fast metabolism, you probably will have to add some carbohydrates to it. You know, so I like mm -hmm. to use whole um, things like whole grains. You know, so so brown rice or, or whole oats or, or whole barley, uh, mm -hmm. and that's how you can blend down th those foods and and, and provide dog. Some dogs know that, that have higher energy requirements with, with those extra easier to assimilate calories that come from from carbohydrates or starches. When you say that you match it pound for pound, the vegetables to the meat, mm -hmm. when you say meat, are you including all the organ meat and the muscle meat? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I'm kind of working on, on revising my recipes and, and kind of working on like two ingredient sauces for on top of the dog food. You know, I, I you know, I, I've been doing this for, I've been doing raw food, feeding advice for over a decade. You know, and it's and it's really hard. You know, so people d just don't stick with it. And and homemade diets are really cumbersome. And, and people look at the recipes, they're like, what? You know, like, oh my god, like <laughs> five things like to put in it. And it needs to be simple. You know, so I'm thinking, you know. Um, I really want my patients to have some fresh foods in their diet, um, and I just hope for like a 50-50 mix of processed foods and fresh foods. You know, that is kind of the goal for a city dog or city cat. You know, so um, and, and I feel that is attainable. That, that is that is actually manageable. And you know, if you can uh, keep a, a food in each world, like you know, it's, it's, you say, hey, like you know, dog food is where my dog's gonna get all those. Vitamins, you know, well, cool. But you know, add something fresh on top of it, you know. So um, again, I'll, I'll I'll probably be coming out with more like ideas of how to just implement uh, fresh food uh, additives to processed foods, you know, so it is more, you know, city folk friendly. Um, mm -hmm. To answer your question, um, no, JJ will get whole foods. Uh, as in, you know, meat on a bone once or twice a week. Um, okay. Because uh, so what I do is I put gizzards in their home cooked food, mm -hmm. and then they get neck bones twice, twice a week. And yeah. I wasn't sure. Like, let's say if their mouth's already healthy, so this is mm -hmm. for me. Is, is that uh, like a good schedule for making sure their teeth stay healthy? That, that's a good maintenance. I think twice a week is is a good maintenance, and most people can actually pull that. Um, yeah, if it's if it's more than that, you know. Well, a it can become pretty rough on a dog's gut. Um, mm. You know, you have to have some variety. And, and you know, I do love raw foods, but it's not like it's a cure for all. You know, so um, you know, I'm more of a fan of variety than than one specific food, even if it's raw food. Um, so, so yeah, I think twice a week is not bad. You know, I, 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 in fact, I tell people, hey, like if you can do something over the weekend to introduce whole food that your dog has to. Um, take a part. Again, it's like a it's, it's a very outdoors type of food. You know, you, you don't want to give it in a house because it is quite messy. You know, so especially with multiple dogs. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's nice to have a, a deck or, or or a porch of some sort or, or 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 a backyard where you can just you know go out and and see your dog enjoy taking a part in a, a, 
a, a piece of meat on, on a bone, like a neck. Mm -hmm. uh, so you want, you know, again, once a, once a week, once, twice a week is, is not a bad uh, schedule. You know, if if the dogs have other things in between that they can use to to chew on. So and again, there's nothing wrong with, with dog toys. Like if right. they like flash toys and and shake them and chew them, well, that is effective grinding. You know, that, that is effective chewing. You know, so it does mm -hmm. it does. Uh, produce the same type of uh, result as if they were actually chewing on something that, that is edible. Um, I mean, they don't swallow the toys, but the chewing is very similar to what they would be doing if they were trying to take apart a, a whole piece of food. So does it make sense? You know, gizzards, gizzards, well, she swallows gizzards. You know, most dogs her size oh. will be like, gulp, and it's gone, you know, so. <laughs> you have to watch and see if they're using it. The chew and if it's really working in that way. Yeah, I, you know, it takes her about what, 60 seconds to take to to, to take down a, a drumstick. You know, I tried chicken eggs; they are gone in 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. And and again, they are crushed. They are really thoroughly crushed. But the way it's swallowed, it's still a, a chicken egg looking thing. I mean, the bones are pulverized on the inside, but uh, but, but it's just it's it's, it's, it's too easy. It's just too easy for her, so I, I want to challenge her mouth, which is you know when she gets that that oxtail or 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 turkey. Neck. Oxtail, yeah. Oxtail, you know, and yes. oxtail is like, yeah, it's kind of weird and gross, but um, you know, it's kind of jelly and fatty, you know. Uh, it's it, it's it can be quite rich depending on how heavy the the cap was mm -hmm. that, that gave up the the, the the tail. So um, mm -hmm. so that is that is the deal with using food. To clean them out, you know. So, so think of foods that create a lot of dental deposit, you know, starchy foods. So, you know, dog food, both dry foods and, and, and canned food, will be, you know, half flour. So, they, they will produce a significant amount of uh, of, of plaque. Um, you know, dry foods. Well, do an experiment. You know, go home and and eat a cup of dry cereal. Um, and, and, and see how your mouth feels after eating it, you know, and, and see, you know, what kind of stuff you end up on the surface of, of your teeth. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, like, you know, if you, if you eat lots of cookies or pretzels or, or donuts or starchy foods, like, you kind of end up, like, after a while, you, you actually start tasting the acidity, mm -hmm. you know, because it is, it is, the bacteria in your mouth will, will use all the leftover food and, and they will produce quite acidic residues um, mm -hmm. as a byproduct and, and and acid is usually not is not a friend to your enamel. Um, so you know if uh, other things, well, dental cleaning. You know, so there are you know non anesthetic dental cleanings are become more and more more popular. So these are teams of veterinary technicians or or people who are trained in that specific technique where you know they they are trained to restrain a dog that is awake um, in a very specific way and use an ultrasonic scaler to to scale the teeth to pop off all that, that brown and yellow stuff of the surface of the enamel. Um, they do go uh, underneath the, the gum line, so a bit of a scooping of the edgeable packet and they, you know, they polish, they, some dogs will allow probing, you know, using a dental probe to actually measure the, the depth of the packet. Um, is it stressful in dogs? Yeah, yeah, you know, it's probably not the, the most fun thing that they they experience, you know, but, but you know, um, and this is true about any um, any person that works in, in the veterinary field, you kind of learn that, um, you know, when you when you have patients coming in, like, you have to be very confident and, and you have to be on a mental uh, state of, like, you know, this is happening, this is going to happen, I'm doing this, you know, there's no question. And, and most dogs will actually submit to it if they have a strong leadership uh, and someone who just, you know, doesn't leave them any room for making their own decisions, you know, that they'll submit. <laughs> there is definitely dogs who will have a very rough ride with the non dental cleanings and, you know, and, and, and these guys, some of these guys, you know, will do better with with some anxiolytic medications like diazepam, or uh, which is Valium, or or Alprazolam, which is a Xanax, um, and these you know, these are uh, short-acting um, anxiolytic medications that people also take before going to a dentist. So they have very similar um, effect. You know, they don't really sedate to a significant degree. They just take that that floating anxiety, that that fear of like what could happen away. So 
So, you know, if you think about it, you can go to the dentist and be like, hmm. Well, why is people away. choose the non anesthetic dental versus the traditional? Well, price is a big thing, you know. So, oh. then, so the cost of the conductive anesthesia, you know, people, people, you know, look at the estimates for dental procedure and they're like, whoa, like $1,000. Um, hey, you know, get, get an estimate from your doctor. You know, if, if you were to be under anesthesia for an hour, it's going to be $50,000, you know, so it's, it's a pretty good deal for the anesthesia that is, that is you know, as good as what a kid or, or a person would get. Um, so cost is one thing. You know, two, most people are very afraid of anesthesia because, you know, they've got, had pets or heard of pets that, that died under anesthesia, and, and that is definitely possible. You know, it's, uh, anesthesia is a, if it's not done right, it's, it can be quite dangerous. So um, in my practice, you know, we, we use techniques that are used, or protocols that are used in human medicine, which is, a, you know, propofol. It's, a, it's an induction drug to get them under so they can be intubated and then maintained with a, with a gas, um, and you can um, you can mani manipulate the uh, the percent saturation, um, uh, or how much of the anesthetic gas goes into a oxygen oxygen mi mixture. So you can fine tune their anesthetic plane so they aren't too light, as in there's no blink reflex, but they're not too deep where the eyes are ro roll backwards. Mm -hmm. You know, so and of course you have a whole bunch of monitors telling you also like you know, where they are. You know, like what's what's the blood pressure doing? What's the uh, false eyes doing? You know how how is the EKG looking? Um, so you know what? How is the temperature? Um, all, all these things will be impacted by by anesthesia that is too too deep. You know, so the, the impact on blood pressure is actually quite direct. You know, if they're over sedated with anesthetics, um, you know, you're able to crack up those fluids uh, and decrease anesthesia. Otherwise, you know, you end up with a patient that's that's an effective shock, as in, you know, very close to a cardiovascular collapse and, mm -hmm. and cardiac arrest. So very, very dangerous stuff. Um, hey, you know, it's, anesthesia is, is a serious, serious business. And um, Quick question. Yes. So for a dog to wake up from, uh, how mm. quickly? Oh, it's quick. It's very it should quick. should be quick, right? Mm -hmm. Well, but then the amount of the grogginess, uh, you know, afterwards, as in the hangover, depends on the length of anesthesia and how stable they were, you know, how, how low they dipped uh, as far as their body temperature, you know, if, if a dog goes you know, below 98 or 97, um, you know, they'll wake up slower and they will have more, uh, war, they'll have more of a hangover. Um, you know, liver doesn't really break things down very well, like below 96 degrees, you know, body temperature in dogs. So, um, so yeah, the, the hangover would be corresponding to, you know, how low their blood pressure was at any given point during anesthesia and, and what's happening with temperature. There, you know, we, it's a waste procedure. When you're doing teeth, it is it's a lot of water going through your mouth because, you know, the scaler, alternate scaler tip vibrates at, I don't I don't know how many thousand times a minute, you know, so and it's very hot. It has to be cooled at all mm -hmm. times with a with a mist of water. So mm -hmm. there's always water going through your mouth and it's you know, it's, and it's cooling. Uh, you know, the muzzle gets gets wet, the hair gets wet, um, the head gets wet and that's and it can really impact the uh, the core temperature. So um, well, you know, then some dogs go under for twenty minutes and, and I scale the teeth and you know, a little periodontal treatment. Um, boom, they're, they're up, you know, they're ready to go home in two hours. They, they, they look as though nothing happened. You know, they have, they'll have a multi day, but it's okay. Uh, and then we have our, you know, 12 to 16 year old dogs that have come in first time in, you know, five years for dental work and, and there's distractions, you know, and, and you know, it, it is not that quick. Uh, you know, when it comes to craniosal teeth, unless they're pretty rotten, like those dogs there, you know, um, they have to be cut. Like each root has to be cut mm -hmm. so it's separate from the rest of the tooth. Uh, you know, it's really, it's really hard to uproot a tree that has two huge roots, you know, so mm -hmm. you have to cut That's the roots small. and pull each of them separately, otherwise you, you fracture roots and you have, you have those, you have retained roots which are actually huge, huge problems, you know, if you have retained dental roots uh, after a, a batch dental procedure are, are almost as bad as, as having that bad tooth still in there. You know, it's, it's going to take a long time for, for it to fester out from the, from, from the bottom of that socket, especially if it's a lower socket. 
Um, so, so you know, if I if, if I'm not sure that I got the whole route because you know it's super crumbly, the, the, the boat is just super decayed, and you know I I, I flash spray, you know, use a, a an air pump, and, and like there's you know some indication that there, there may be still some tooth material in there. You know, I I take a dental X-ray and make sure it's not the case before you know I suture the, the socket. Otherwise, again, you, you trap a foreign body basically in you know underneath this, the, the skin, which would be again a huge nidus or, or a huge seat for the infection. Uh, so you know, so so older doggies you know who have to have lots of dental work done. Well, of course, they're not as stable, and also they are exhausted by many years of constant infections. So, mm -hmm. so yes, they'll be they'll be more groggy. Um, I really haven't had any dogs be mopey than. 48 hours after the, the propofol iso mixture as far as anesthesia. So, and of course, you know, you manage the pain as well. Uh, and you manage dysphoria. You know, dogs also get, you know, there's, it's, it's definitely a, a bit of a shake up of the, of the trust that they have developed, you know, between themselves and, and their owners, you know. So, um, so, you know, it, it does take, you know, several days to get over and a week till the dog is, you know, Kind of back to normal personality wise. So the hills get you the human protocol for the anesthesia, and mm. but how, are the vet do the exact same thing, or I heard that there are different ways to administer anesthesia. And, oh sure, right? sure. And how do we? I say this because my foster went through dental too, and the doctor, the notes say he was very slow to recover, and mm. stand by flag that uh -uh, that should not have been. Slow as in days. Or to, hours to come out of it. Hours or days? I he was not noted, oh. and I learned from my also neighbors that he did you know teeth cleaning both in one way, mm -hmm. meaning one type of anesthesia. Mm -hmm. I forgot the name of it, mm -hmm. but something happened. So mm -hmm. he switched to another method, which sounds like yours. Mm -hmm. yeah. That dog will come out of it pretty much right away. So there's a less risk of dog being under. Yeah, you know, as far as anesthetic gas, you know, I don't think any vets use any, anything less than isofluorane. You know, some some vets use seofluorane, which is um, like even newer and better. You have like more fine tuning control because it's a it's like a quicker um, action. It's like uh, how do I explain this? You have more con it, it's it's like more finer control of where they are as far as the anesthetic depth. Uh, and and yet they lose very quickly with it and they recover very quickly. The the, the way the body gets rid of this is very very fast. You know, isofluorine um, before you uh, get rid of all of it from the bloodstream, it is between three and five minutes. Mm -hmm. You know. So, however, you know. But then, how about how about those induction drugs? You know. So so propofol is great. You know, people that have wisdom teeth taken out or colonoscopies or other short procedures will get a shot of propofol, which is awesome. It's, it's a very, very smooth ride, very nice recovery. Uh, so other, you know, there's definitely other uh, protocols like of I mean, a whole bunch, you know, ketamine and, and, and Valium, um, metatomidine and Valium. Um, other drugs that will have probably more of an impact on cardiovascular health, like mm -hmm. as in like blood pressure or, or heart rate, you know. So, and then, and besides drugs, actually, hey, you know, if you don't have your doggy wrapped up in a, a, a in two hot Ooh. layers and they do get cold, they're gonna have very bad recovery. You know, if if you have if the dog doesn't have fluids going and you allow the blood pressure to dip and stay low for too long. It's going to be a bad recovery. So they're not always um, the bad recoveries aren't always caused by particular type of induction agents, agents or maintenance uh, anesthetics. Uh, they are caused by a, a, a procedure that's a very poor quality, as in like you know the the, the patient wasn't kept within parameters of of a. Uh, you know where they should should have been, as in like you know again blood pressure and temperature are, are, are huge. You know it's a you cannot push them like almost to the door doorsteps of death and expect like no hangover. You know if their temperature doesn't budge, you know this, if it's like if, if it started 100.5 and and it's the same throughout the 20 minutes and they wake up and and you know, nothing really has 
change temperature wise and mm. pressures were constant. Well, you know, these dogs are like up and ready to go. You know, five minutes later to go for a walk, they pee. You know, I call the owner, pick up a two, you know. So um, easy breezy. But um, well, I, I really cannot comment on, on anyone's work because I'm not there, you know, so I can tell you what I do and, and I would encourage everyone to, you know, I, I guess vets are looked upon as someone of like pediatricians, you know, so, so you should definitely have a, a good explanation of how an anesthesia will be performed on your, on your pet, on your dog or cat, you know, because you want to know there's a, someone who will monitor this, this patient it's not like one tech doing everything, and you know, mm -hmm. they'll be doing the teeth, mm -hmm. but and maybe one every ten minutes they'll they look up and look at the machine if there are any attached to a dog, you know. So there's, I mean, I've been to places where, you know, you have, you get maybe like a pulse axis and tongue, and that's about it. And um, mm -hmm. and there's plenty of places that don't use intravenous fluids at all. Uh, so there is really no ways of quickly raise the blood pressure if if needed, right? You know, if there's a need for it. So, um, hey, anesthetics are depressant medications, so so they will they will tend to cause low blood pressure and decreasing body temperature. So, anesthesias are not created equal, mm -hmm. um, and neither are anesthetics. But it's a, it's it's more than just the drugs that you're using um, that that causes a either a, a very smooth recovery or prolonged, you know, many many days. Recovery, you know. So um, that's, that's your question. So, um, why else do people not want to do anesthesia? Why don't you guys want to do anesthesia for your <laughs> dog and, and cats? Do you guys, or does anyone have problems with anesthesia? Like, and I've, you know, it's, it's all about education, right? You know, the more you know about it and, and what's involved in it, the more you're scared of it and, and you don't anticipate a bad outcome from it. You know, like if you're if like, oh my God, like they'll put my dog out and with drugs and, and, you know, do things to him or her and you don't know the details, well, you're going to be, you're going to, your mind will create details, you know, as in like the dog was taken to the, to the gates of hell and, and back, you know, barely. So, um, and, and that might be the case, you know. Again, it's uh, not 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 here, not in San Francisco. But if you you know if you go elsewhere, again, vets have different uh, standards of how they conduct anesthesia. Yeah, I went to a surgery once, and I woke up with so much pain, and they start giving me that you know pain medication right away. Mm -hmm. Does the same thing happen for a dog when you're coming out of a surgery, or do you have deep piece pain? Deep pain. In just there's a follow up. The pain yeah. medication is already given. Well, the time they wake up, or like later. Because well, I was like, it's really painful. It's really mm -hmm. painful. Please give me something. I think goes enough. Well, it depends. You know, I mean, you don't want to like sh drag them up wh while they're recovering because they they don't wake up. You know, you, you cannot give them more drugs <laughs> right. as you try to recover them. So uh, a minute, like a minute, like I woke up, yes, you know, start right. getting the morphine in. Oh. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I use buprenorphine, which is similar to morphine, you know, and that is usually given at recovery. So, you know, once the tube is out and if there's any type of, you know, again, dysphoria, like unhappiness, you know, maniacal behavior, hysteria, or, or, or pain, you know, I'd like to think that pain is not really an issue because, uh, you know, hey, dogs got their shot of, of anti-inflammatory medication, you know, before procedure. Mm -hmm. They've had uh, some narcotic pain reliever as a, as a part of the pre-med. Um, if there was any extractions, you know, the, there were local blocks performed, so the so the area is numb. So mm -hmm. so usually the, the hysteria is not pain based. It is it is just a well, it's, it's not feeling right because you know dogs do feel like they have been almost killed, uh, and uh, and they wake up and you know they they oftentimes don't have very good control of their body. So mm -hmm. that is a that is definitely a reason for. Uh, mm -hmm. For distress, I think of your dog who doesn't want her mouth attached. You know how will she feel when she's not in control? You know she, she's being handled and passed around, and she really has no strength to 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 deal with it. You know, so that's gonna be that's gonna be like one screaming dog, and that dog would have to get a shadow of morphine or or buprenorphine IV at you know, at the time of recovery. So it's otherwise, not a standard protocol to give that after the procedure. It really depends. It really depends how they wake up, you know, I'll say, you know, 
three quarters of the dogs and cats will recover nice and smooth, you know, no no clots, you know, no problems. You know, the other quarter will will have a bit of a fit. And again, I don't, it's, it doesn't matter if it's, it was like hour and a half with extractions or twenty minutes, you know, you know, clean and polish. Um, it, it is somewhat of a function of their personality. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, some some dogs just get really spooked by this whole thing. So um, hey, you know, but these dogs probably wouldn't do very well with the anesthesia free dental cleaning because you know then they are being handled in a way that, that also makes that puts them makes them not not in control. Mm -hmm. um, but, but yeah, you know, pain control is huge. There's really no reason to be painful. Uh, especially if you are losing teeth, you know. So you know, pain control is very, very important, and and that is, you know, that is kind of your job as a as a dog or cat owner. Um, those first, you know, two days after dental procedure, you know, it is your job to evaluate uh, the degree of pain that the patient is exhibiting, and you know, and and manage it with pain medication. It's usually something like tramadol, which is a like a numbing agent, you know. So um, n not like morphine; it's not as strong, but it does a decent job. Um, and and yeah, again, most most dogs will will have had a an injection of of Malaxicam or Medicam, um, mm. you, you know, which which kind of break doesn't allow tissues to get too swollen, too inflamed, uh, and it does deactivate certain pain pathways. So so you don't wake up with so they don't wake up with pain. And the dog ever be allergic to certain kind of pain medication? Because it turned out I was. <laughs> I mean, I'm an adult dog, but you know, morphine I was allergic to, and I had mm -hmm. a reaction. So that the nurse who gave me a different kind of pain medication, mm -hmm. something like that, can happen to a dog or cat. So I, uh, I actually never heard of like bad reactions to narcotic agents, but I guess uh, the, I guess it could happen. You know, the reaction could be like you have too much of the. Um, like dip in the blood pressure, or you get lightheaded, you know. So it's not really a, a chemical reaction that like that you would have to, you know, to to see food, but it's still it's, but, it's yeah, a bad reaction, right, right. you know. So well, and like you have, you have like this little tube in your vein, like messing with the with the walls of the vein, like you know, causing thrombotic showers, you know, like uh, you know, like yes, this is definitely a good time to react badly to things when you're <laughs> when you're under anesthesia or when you're recovering. So, um, uh, but uh, yeah, you know, again, when it comes to dental health um, in dogs, you know, and especially when when it gets to the point where they do need to have significant dental work done, it is really best to have it not have them experience this, you know, because. Because it is unpleasant. Yeah. Yeah, so I love the idea of preventing this the dogs doing their own uh, brushing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but so uh, in our case, we have a small dog, so 11 pounds. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm just wondering. I just I, I have this fear of giving like the this the chicken bones. Like I wonder what like I could we couldn't give. Uh, a wing, like a, I'm sorry, a whatever. Well, well, fine. So, 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 so do gizzards and, and, and get the beef heart. You know, you can cut a beef heart or you can, you know, get strips of, a, of, of, a, of tripe, which is cow stomach. You know, it, and mm -hmm. it's, it's just as difficult to chew that up as it is to chew up a bone. You know, I, I don't really think of bones as that dangerous of organs. You know, they're actually quite fragile, just like teeth. You know, the, the bone ends up in a in a very acidic stomach of a dog, and it and it stands no chance. It, it gets leached out on contact. It's just sometimes how those chicken bones, like the time thinking they as as chicken. Raw. Mm -hmm. As long as it's raw. Mm -hmm. Right. So so you guys you know the distinction between like the raw bones and cooked bones, right? You know, so um. So, so raw bone is a is a very fragile organ. You know, it, it is very um, easy to to damage by by you know when you put them in a highly acidic environment. So you know, dogs they are designed to to eat bones. So their bodies are are prepared for it. You know, so as they as they as they rip a part of animal and and chew it in the grinding and swallow it, well, th those bones get decalcified pretty much on contact with the stomach acid, which is which is about. One thousand times as as big as, as our stomachs, you know. So, so, so way, way more like way lower pH in their stomach than ours. You know, we have like a stomach pH of, of five. They have a stomach pH of two, which is very acidic. 
Um, so, um, so you know, you will see, you will see, hey, you will see cartilage coming out. You will, you know, but not bones. Mm -hmm. Cartilage. Can I mention that I noticed that when they're eating bones, that their poop looks white here. Right. Yeah, yeah. That was kind of a, you know, I first started uh, raw foods like back in 2001 or two, you know, and, and I lived in Vermont on this, on this big 10 acre farm with 12 dogs and a three legged wolf and a bunch of cats. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, and then we started doing this, you know, we, we, had a, we, we found this local um, organic chicken and turkey farmers and we would get 50 pound boxes of chicken and turkey bags, you know, and, mm -hmm. and um, so. You know, once I ran run of my like all the free dog food I got from vet school, you know, then it was like, you know, hey, how how like people twelve dogs? So hey, twenty five cents a pound. You cannot really do better than that, right? So um, yeah. So what happens with the poop of the dog that eats this type of food is that the poops go from big and brown to tiny, dry and crumbly, as in they don't smell. You know, you step on them and they 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 this it's like a, yeah, it's like lightly blue gravel. You know, so all you get is that the, the, uh, uh, calcium uh, carbonate and calcium phosphate residues, you know. So um, it is really cool to see how well dogs can tap into that food and, and, and suck everything out of it. Mm -hmm. And then you feed them dog food and, you know, a lot of that stuff comes out and, you, and, you know, the, the, the fecal volume is pretty horrendous, you know. When, <laughs> when, and then if, when you have a dog that has any type of issue with that food, well, it seems that the, the, the poops are bulkier than the food itself. Like mm -hmm. there's more of it coming out, you know, because it actually it stole so much water from the body, you know. So, mm -hmm. so in many instances, you know, feeding dog food is, is actually quite detrimental for a for a health of a dog um, for many reasons. So, um, so hey, if you have an issue with bones, there there is plenty of whole foods that that, that are bone free. No, I mean I don't particularly have. I, I guess I have a fear, but. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes I'll stop at the butcher and get like the geysers or the livers or mm -hmm. uh, and like so for example I look at those like uh, chicken feet mm -hmm. and I don't know it just looks like <laughs> I know the nails look like they would puncture the something yes were, right? exactly but, yeah. but like they, I don't... they don't right I don't know we oh. always tell just to put them up so you never have to worry about it but I mean even <laughs> if they did it <laughs> yeah. them, then you don't. But even um, if they did, it's it's not or, ch or chicken wings. So I was tempted mm -hmm. to try the chicken wings because mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, that's smaller. Maybe you can crush mm -hmm. through it. Mm -hmm. So he, he likes to chew. Yeah. Um, but I still, I don't know. I feel like. I mean, is it really okay if they ate the chicken feet and they ate the nails and everything? Yeah, I think so. I mean. Actually, you know, I know. It's, I want to tell this story. <laughs> I was watching Adam the dog once. And he ate glass. And you said <laughs> it was okay because yeah. stomach acid. There's this way well, it is. It's so strong. Yeah, you know, and, and again, like you know, when you think of the, the, the lining of your mouth, esophagus, stomach, and um, and the intestines, you know, I mean, this stuff is designed for wear and tear, and a heavy one too, you know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's not like fiber is gentle on a on a mucous membrane. You know, I mean, you, you get it ripped to shreds every time you eat spicy things or or shardy things, you know. Or, um, well, but of course, your body continuously. Uh, regenerates mucous membrane, right? So, and 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 dogs are even better that better at that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, their esophagus is a is stratified epithelium, which is like what you have, like on your skin, two thirds down. Like we are all mucous membrane. They they actually have way tougher first part of the esophagus because you know they are, um, they they are built to eat pretty harsh things. Um, so their mucous membranes have to put up with more wear and tear and more harsh things, um, abrasive things, you know, contacting them. So um, nails of the, you know, like the, the, the meat, the bone to meat and skin ratio is important, you know. So yes, if you have a dog that gets in the pile of bones, whether they, even raw ones, you know, maybe it's going to be too much bone and not enough meat and other other kind of slimy tissue to buffer the, the sharp edges of it, you know. So um, definitely once you cook bones, they become very hard to digest and, um, and you kind of cook them or bake them into a very specific shape that is not, that is no longer um, susceptible to leaching out by a stomach acid, you know. So, so those bones have to be passed 
pretty much the way they were swallowed. And mm. if a dog happens to, to swallow a, a very long shard of it, well, mm. it's hard to to pass a, a shardy, sharp piece of, of very hard material uh, through a, a muscular tube that keeps mm. contracting and, and pushing things along. You know, oftentimes it will have, you will have some type of puncture or, 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 the, or the shard will get stuck. It's usually, you know, it's, it's usually puncture and perforation. So perforating ulcers leading to peritonitis is, is what happens to dogs that, that eat cooked chicken bones. So only cooked, so like raw bones will never mm -hmm. stay shardy because the stomach acids are so strong. Right, and, and, and we're talking about dogs with, with, with decent, you know, as in like, you know, healthy digestion. You know, dogs, if you guys ever had dogs that had like weak digestion, as in they always get diarrhea, they always have problems, they always get giardia. Well, you know, th these dogs, like, things don't really stay in them for very long. Um, certain breeds seem to be, certain breeds also tend to have very, very fast GI transit time. Like, you know, most German Shepherds, I can, I can get off of dry foods uh, and, and take, take them through, you know, homemade diets into, into pre-ground raw foods, like primal, you know, but once you start giving them whole foods, you, you actually you actually can see pieces of bone coming out because they got their their guts move so fast, and they don't have enough time to to process foods the way they should be processed. So, and yes, if they aren't, you know, it's, it it does have an impact on the on the next part of the intestine. So, you know, which is some type of dysfunction and usually it leads to diarrhea, mm -hmm. um, if not vomiting. Is that also size related or just breed related? Like, if I say give my chicken wing to a seven pound, like my seven pound dog, is it because her GI tract is so much shorter, is she going to have difficulty with that? Her GI tract is not shorter proportionally, it's, it's, I mean, everything is smaller, yeah. but the length is, is very similar, but you know, you have a more like bird-like creature, creature that is faster metabolically, you know, so things do move faster, you know, and, and these guys usually you put them on raw foods and they tend to lose weight like crazy. Like they get super skinny, right? Yeah. So, so if because she's already it's, scrawny. Then because it's not enough, you know, you have to you have, you have to like you have to keep up with the metabolic demands okay. and, and the the smaller the creature the 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 higher the carb to protein to fat ratio you need to have, you know, hey, hundred pounds, you know, Great Dane can be on raw foods, can be like on, on raw meat and, and veggies only and never touch it. You know, a grain of rice or potato. Your five pound chihuahuas, they they don't do well on raw alone. You have to mm. usually mix it half and half with 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 some type of carb. Maybe mm. not half and half, but to, to some extent, you have to, yeah. you have to make it blend. I yeah, I usually make those about 50%. Yeah, mm. you know, and, and that's kind of the part that you can fine tune. Hey, if she's gaining a little bit too much, well, you you pinch on on the uh, on the proportions of the carb in the meal, you know, if, if she's too scrawny, well, you are not a tablespoon to the mix, you know, so, so carb is how you fine tune the weight, um, so, so your meat and veggies is your, your base, and then the carbs use as needed, uh, you know, as most dogs get older, um, you know, they don't do well on, on dog foods because they are so starch heavy, and, and, and these dogs, um, there's just no way to burn it, you know, so they get mm -hmm. really heavy and impact their, their, their joints, you know, the, mm -hmm. Once they get heavy, the the back and joints get more stiff. They they end up with this you know stress build up of extra calories, which is um, in the belly, right? You know this this uh, this cortisol induced um, uh, pear shaped uh, look to the dog. Um, so um, so yeah, and these dogs you know do great if you just you can, it can be as simple as mixing the dog food half and half with with steamed broccoli. Or veggies, you know, and it's a, it's it's actually a very very easy remedy to to make a dog not have digestive upset and actually, you know, kind of match their caloric intake with what they're spending, you know, mm -hmm. to actually affect the weight um, as and get them back to their target weight. Mm -hmm. That's a good tip right uh, there. How, how are we doing time wise? It's eight. 50. Oh, wow. All right. Uh, uh, well, I guess let's open up to, to other questions. Uh, you guys can read through, uh, through the rest of the notes. The first page, I just type up, you know, types of dental problems I see most commonly, you know, so again, I'm from, um, from
from, from harder to, to gum recession to periodontal disease, uh, dental infections, draining abscesses, uh, either on, on, on the face or, or internally. Um, consequences of, of having bad teeth, well, ask, ask your dentist, you know, you could get uh, the bugs from the gum line can get embolized, run by blood clots, and they can go elsewhere in, in your body. Usually, you know, they go and see the, the leaflets of the of the heart valves, you know, leading to a leading to a what's called vegetative endocarditis, having living creatures living living on a, a, a on, on your heart uh, valve leaflets and and making them bumpy. So when they close, they don't close completely, and you end up with some backflow of, of the blood as the as the chamber contracts. So, so the, oh. the, the etiology of the of the of many heart murmurs that are induced by by chronic gingivitis or periodontal oh. disease. Um, you know, pain. Again, it's really hard to document it, but it, it, I think it is it, if if it's not pain, you know, it is still a a huge amount of inflammatory load and pose on the body. You know, think of how you feel when you have any type of infection, even like a simple, like three day long flu, you know, it is very draining. Well, think of having this all the time. It, it is, it is very, it, you know, it, it, it diverts immune resources from, from fighting of bacteria and viruses mm -hmm. and those cancer cells that are born in our bodies every day of our life. And, and, you know, we have to have, you know, we have a very good mechanism of killing off abnormal cells. Um, if the body is busy, you know, dealing with mm -hmm. trying to push out the tube that's, you know, it's going to take five years to push it out finally, well, you know, you could have some of those bad cells, uh, you know, gain a foothold in the body and, and develop into a nodule or, or, or malignant growth. Um, so, and, and also, not to mention, like, locally, you know, uh, chronic inflammation is a very good place for, for bad things to happen, including um, including uh, cancerous growths, you know, so squamous carcinomas, lymphomas, um, melanomas in the mouth are common, and, and you know, the, the, the more horrendous the mouth is, the more likely it is to have it. Uh, and, you know, tooth loss, again, it's, uh, you know, it, it may be, at some point, it's like, well, it, it just has to go. You know, the tooth is the tooth is just too badly damaged. You know, it's there's just no way to save it. And at, at that point, it's really good to just take it out. You know, it's not gonna it's not going to be used again because it's it's really too painful to use. So it is it is just a it is kind of like a piece of bone stuck in a jaw that's that is that is not being used. That is slowly festering out. Um, so if I have a patient under and I can, if I can put a probe, slide a probe a bit in a space between the roots, that is usually when there's too much of that periodontal ligament lost to save the tooth, you know, even with periodontal treatment and sealants and all kinds of like long-term antibiotic therapy, um, you know, it's, it's, it, it gets really tough. I usually take x-rays of, of those teeth and, and you'll see um, like a lot of that, of the bone in between the roots will be all decalcified and like it look like there's hair in there, you know, and there's some bone, but it's so porous, it's so leached out, it, it actually looks like there is no bone there. Um, so, um, any questions on on managing dental health in in your dogs or cats? Can I repeat it? So, say so her breath is pretty bad. Uh -huh. um, is there things to do to prevent, is like just really just halitosis? Or is, I mean, that's, is that from the plaque? Well, it's usually from the, yeah, it is from the plaque, but it's also from gingivitis. You know, it's from, from, your, from tissues oozing out protein rich fluid, which then, you know, is eaten by the bacteria in the mouth. So, so it is pretty raunchy. Um, and if, if the dental discomfort is, is bad enough, you know, you're going to have some degree of gastritis as in stomach irritation. So there's also like a bad breath from, from sour stomach. So it's a combination of, of, of two things. If there's actually um, any like active infection of the, of the dentin or, or root, you know, you, there's a, well, I can usually spot a, a decaying tooth, like actively decaying tooth. You know, there's a, there's a, 
is more than just like a rotten meat smell. Like rotten bone is like a one degree stinkier yeah, than, like than rotten meat. It smells uh, like trash. <laughs> oh, the, the trash mouth is usually just from ginger. Actually, the trash mouth is usually from from bad stomach. Yeah. Like this, yeah. uh, this like I know the the floor map water smell. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I, I know the smell. I, I know the smell <laughs> well. So. Um, if life will do and get different dogs, you could say yes. Uh, is that something that like getting a teeth clean would help them, or is it actually more internal? It might, you know, so like, you know, dogs that have chronic stomach irritation will end up with bad teeth, and and one thing will, and then bad teeth, you know, as as a source of discomfort will cause more stomach irritation. So it really is a vicious cycle. Yeah, we just don't seem to have a bad stomach which doesn't grow up often have diarrhea. That's cool. So maybe it's just the teeth, you know, and the gums. Um, and yeah, as far as things to cover the smell, well, sure, she can, you know, chew on a mint leaves, you know, and, and you can, you know, find other cl 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 chlorophyll-rich uh, snacks or foods, you know, so um, like greenies. I think greenies have a decent amount of chlorophyll in them besides, you know, whatever corn starch or whatever they use. To actually make a shape of it, you know, but but yeah, there are things that will that will um, that will somewhat uh, uh, lessen the the potency of the of the smell. Of the... Getting, just paying for the cleaning and doing it. Recommend well, you know, maybe the dog would be okay with four anesthesia, free dental cleaning. You know, if it's if it's not so bad in there, but yeah, at some point you have to just. Yeah, I don't just... think it's too bad. In there, I don't want it to get. Right, right, right. You know, so so once it's back to being clean, then that's when you can do your preventive techniques to to make sure it doesn't happen again in six or twelve months, and you have to you know spend another thousand bucks on it. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, but but you know, I think that if if there is one point to take out of this is that you know it, it really is better to have no teeth than to have infected teeth. It is. It is not good to, to keep those bad teeth in there. Um, they, they, they don't make your dogs or cats feel very well. And and again, it's it's uh, usually people don't even realize till after the the problem has been take, taken care of, and and dogs and cats actually are back to what they were a few years prior. Um, you know, because you know, as as a dog owner or cat owner, you know things happen slowly, and you will kind of shove it under the the carpet of well. They're just getting older, you know. It's mm -hmm. normal. So, um, and, and it is again, it is normal for teeth to to age, and you know, Chinese medicine teeth are controlled by your kidneys, you know. So, mm -hmm. so the so organ that controls the, the water element and uh, and the body, and and, and yeah, as the aging process uh, progresses, you know, so so the kidneys, you know, you lose your kidney gene, your kidney essence, and 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 yes, you know, the the marrow gets weaker, you know, so you get more senile. Or more forgetful, the, the teeth, uh, you know, go away because these are these are managed by the kidneys, and you get gray and, and you get bad joints. So, so all of these things are normal. Um, again, some organs in the body have a very good ability to, to regenerate, to repair uh, themselves. You know, so when you think of intestinal lining, skin, the liver, um, you know, rip, rip it all you want, it'll regrow. Um, you know, bones heal pretty well. You know. Places, that, but you know, joints, teeth, you know, heart, brain, kidneys—they they are not so forgiving. And if you damage them, uh, you will get some type of a, a, a scar tissue plug to replace a lost to replace a lost normal tissue. And, um, and of course, you know, the, the remainder of the organ has to pick up the slack for the lost parts. So there's more workload and pause on, on the remaining part. So. Um, um, so, so, so again, you should expect some degree of like, you know, dog getting long in a tooth, which is exactly that, you know, this gingival recession, it's, it's gums moving up, exposing the, the root, you know, and, and you know, I, I, I have plenty of bonding done because, you know, you start getting that, that orange crescent on top of the, the crown, you know, and, and that is because there's too much candy, <laughs> so tasty, you know, and all of this, you know, it's, it's, uh, it does happen, you know. Again, it's not something that can be prevented completely, but can be slowed down. Just like, you know, a demise of, of joint health can be slowed down, you know, by by different techniques uh, and management protocols. You know, so can a, a dental health be maintained um, 
in a way that the dog doesn't start losing teeth at mm. three or four years of age, mm. Mm. which you know happens often those days. Oh, uh, we don't know. She was a stray. I thought she was eight. Mm. Just maybe she's six. Maybe she she's five. She, I think she's very young, actually. You know. She looked older when she mm. got here. Mm -hmm. right. she was so a lot of mud filled dogs do. A lot yeah. of mud dogs come here and they look older because they're so unhealthy, mm -hmm. and we bring back the health and. Their fur gets better, their teeth get better. Right, and you know, and the, teeth, the teeth, especially in toy breeds, small breeds, you know, it's, it's very tricky to actually use them to, to gauge the, the, the age of the animal because mm. you know, some of these small doggies have been fed things that weren't very conducive to general health and, and, um, and, and things happen to teeth that, that ends up triggering the periodontal disease and, and, and leads to dental infections and and then it's all rotten mouth, you know. So mm -hmm. and it can happen uh, it's gonna happen early, like you know, three, four years of age. Mm -hmm. I, I I had a, I had my youngest cat the other week that, that lost carnesial teeth. The cat was four years old and, and it was handfuls on, on those wow. huge three rooted upper carnesials, uh, which I've never seen before. The only thing that was holding the, those teeth in was this great Gel. Um, I actually never seen teeth like that. So it was that was like the youngest cat with one of the worst teeth I've seen. And what do you think caused that? The food, the type of food, or food? Well, you know, it's yeah, the, the, the food will impact it. You know, so if the food causes any type of stomach irritation, you know, you're already gonna have a, a hot stomach and, and hot, you know. Heartburn, mm -hmm. all kinds of burning sensation, all the way to the mouth, and, and hot mouth, mouth, sticky mouth, uh, dry mouth, uh, and uh, and that's what speeds up the you know, inflammation. You know, this mm -hmm. is like burning, like your gums are burning away, like things are being used up prematurely, and not in the conditions of inflammation. You know, things are rarely replaced with a, a normal tissue. The, the 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 pathway that favors formation of scar tissue is is usually uh, selected, so so you get sclerosis, which is a you know replacement of healthy normal tissue with scar tissue, which is completely non-functional. Uh, so, yeah. So, so teeth and digestion are inextricably linked. Well, well, teeth are part of the digestive apparatus, you know. So they are yeah, you know, they're true. in front of the of the gut tube, you know. So the lips, you know, grab the well, the lips and teeth grab the food, you know. Teeth chop up the food, the tongue looks at it, the muscular tube pushes into a vat full of acid where things are mixed again. Then things get put into small intestines, you know, the gallbladder should step out, pancreas should step out, more mixing, um, more enzymatic production, um, like from cells that line the gut, absorption, you know, taking out all the good things eventually colon receiving indigestible fiber and, and organic particles um, and, and colon sucking out fluid to create a fairly dry formed fecal residue that then is uh, passed through the anus which is the, the last step of the way. So, so your teeth are, uh, you know, I guess you look at the at, at teeth's um, closest cousin which is stomach, you know, and, and a whole chain of, of, of the events, you know, and, and and I can definitely correlate the, the health of the the teeth with the health of the stomach, and and that's really what that's really kind of what gets a lot of dogs, you know. And it's, I guess it's like a toss up between you know like how many dogs have lower GI issues, as in like inflammatory bowel issues, versus how many dogs have gastritis, as in like you know like they aren't happy with food and the level of the stomach, mm -hmm. and think and there's more reflux than loose stools, you know if. If the stomach is tougher than intestine, then you know, then there is no like reflux issues. There is more like loose stools and, and diarrhea and, and and blowouts and mucus and all kinds of nasty stuff, but going the proper way. Um, but um, but the oftentimes it is actually stomach that's that's the first signs of sign of trouble. That the food is just not right for the body type of of the dog. Um, and again, there are other stressful factors. You know, if you have a a dog that's that's kind of nervous or hyper vigilant, you're living in a city. You know, th these dogs will be nervous, they'll be anxious, and and just like people who are anxious, you know, there'll be heartburn issues. 
you know, there'll be also issues, you know, and, mm-hmm. and, and again, these issues tend to spread or spill up towards the mouth. So, uh, you know, when, when Chinese manage periodontal disease, you know, they, they use formulas to cool down the stomach. So, so, the, so there are formulas to, to resolve, you know, stomach heat, stomach inefficiency, whatever the, the, the pattern may be. I hope you guys found it informative. Yeah, and you know, we're taking suggestions for upcoming workshops. So if anyone has a topic that you definitely want Adam to speak about, please do let us know. You can let us know right now. Um, you can also email me, Maria at mudfield.org. Because we are actually, we, we want to do topics that have been suggested more than us just, you know, coming up with. The new one. Yes. Ear maintenance. The ear maintenance. I like that oh, one. Yeah. My dog has chronic ear. Right. Problems. So I guess it, that's the other fallout of like, you know, inappropriate diet is this, the skin <laughs> issues, you know, skin, ear, feet issues, you know. So, and uh, I guess, you know, we've dealt with digestive issues and diets. I guess well, I'm sure we'll kind of cycle through. Different body parts. Through like, you know, like teeth, you know, stomach, gut, joints, yeah. skin, and on. and. And make, like, throw a little, you know, like traditional Chinese medicine in, in it, you know, talk about how to manage inflammation, which, you know, is this, this mysterious thing that everyone, you know, knows is out there, and, and but no one really knows how much of it you need to have to stay healthy or, and how much is too much. Did, um, you, did you ever talk about end-of-life issues? I mean, is that... That's sure. That's a good topic, yeah. That's, that's a good topic, yeah. 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 Anxiety, I, yes. JJ can lead that one. Yes. <laughs> what personality dogs and anxiety? Yep, so, so these guys here, yeah, these guys will take suggestions that they'll let me know and I'll prepare a nice little uh, um, Everybody grab a goodie bag. And-